Action for Saturday, September 16th. British police make an arrest following yesterday's London train bombing. How the U.S. is winning the war on ISIS in court. And in our signature segment, American troops still deployed in Japan and the Japanese island that wants them to leave. Do you feel more safe or less safe oh. with the military here? <laughs> it's less safe. It means we became a target. Next on PBS NewsHour Weekend. From the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center in New York, Hari Srinivasan. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The hunt intensified for the bomber of a London commuter train during Friday morning rush hour. Britain remains on its highest security alert level of critical, meaning authorities believe another attack may be imminent. British police arrested an 18-year-old man in the port city of Dover outside London. They would not say if he's the suspected bomber or an accomplice. Shortly after the arrest, armed police evacuated a neighborhood in the London suburb of Sunbury and searched a house there. The commissioner of London's Metropolitan Police said this is a fast-moving investigation. We will continue to work as hard as we can uh, to make sure that we reduce the threats in this country uh, and that we know exactly um, who it was who did this, whether there's anybody else involved. The train bombing injured at least 29 people, some with burns. The homemade bomb on a timer and hidden in a paint bucket did not fully explode, but did send flames through the subway car. The Parsons Green Station, where the explosion occurred, partly reopened today. ISIS has claimed responsibility. It is the country's fifth terrorist attack this year, including the London Bridge van attack and the suicide bombing outside a concert at a Manchester arena. Organizers billed today's gathering on the Washington, D.C. Mall as the, quote, mother of all rallies in support of President Donald Trump. About 500 Trump supporters turned out for speeches and a concert. They said their purpose was to defend American culture and values. Across from the White House, a smaller group of anti-Trump demonstrators called on Mr. Trump to take a harder line on Russian meddling in the election last year. In a direct challenge to the Trump administration, California's Democrat-controlled legislature early this morning approved a sanctuary state bill. It would strictly limit how much state and local police in all cities can cooperate with federal immigration agents. Governor Jerry Brown has said he'll sign it. But the governor has not said if he'll sign the bill to move up California's presidential primary from June to March in 2020. Legislators want the Golden State to have a greater influence picking the party's nominees. Another bill on Brown's desk would make California the first state to require all presidential candidates to release tax returns for the last five years in order to appear on the primary ballot. In St. Louis, activists are planning further demonstrations over the latest acquittal in a fatal police-involved shooting. Last night, police clashed with protesters of yesterday's acquittal of a white police officer who shot and killed a black driver after a high-speed chase in 2011. Officer Jason Stockley had been charged with first-degree murder for shooting Anthony Lamar Smith five times while Smith sat in his car, an incident captured on police dash cam video. Stockley said he felt he was in danger because he thought Smith was holding a gun, and the judge found prosecutors failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Stockley did not act in self-defense. Prosecutors said Smith did not have a gun. Demonstrations began peacefully, but after dark, police used tear gas and pepper spray to disperse protesters who confronted them, threw rocks and broke windows on the mayor's house. At least 23 people were arrested and 10 officers were injured. Florida power companies say just under a million homes and businesses are still without electricity almost a week after Hurricane Irma struck the state. Tomorrow, for the first time since Irma battered the Florida Keys, residents and business owners will be allowed back to check on their property. The new iPhone 10 will offer facial recognition technology, which has raised concerns over privacy. Read more at pbs.org slash newshour. For the past three years, ISIS has replaced al-Qaeda as the primary terrorist concern in the United States and abroad. ISIS operatives or sympathizers have carried out horrific attacks in London, Paris, Brussels, as well as Orlando, Florida, and San Bernardino, California. 
With investigations into possible ISIS suspects all over the country, the FBI and federal prosecutors have brought terrorism charges in 135 cases, with a 100 percent conviction rate in resolved cases. This week, the Center on National Security at Fordham Law School here in New York released a report on those cases, and the Center's director, Karen Greenberg, joins me now to discuss it. Uh, let's start with, you know, we're talking in the context of another attack in London. What's different about the attacks that are happening in the United States versus what's happening in Europe? Specifically what's different is that we have not seen a lot of attacks the way Europe has in the past many months. The second thing is is that in Europe many of them have been highly organized attacks involving numerous individuals whereas the plots in this country often don't amount to attacks. They, law enforcement often stops them before they even get to any kind of coherent plot. The attacks that we have seen have sort of been separate from what law enforcement is doing. But for the most part, the landscape looks very different in the United States in terms of number, complexity, and, uh, and other things like that. So a lot of the times, I guess, in the U.S., it's people that are plotting to, and, and sometimes with the assistance of the government, and a, a kind of a, a sting operation? You know, it's interesting. There is an, there's always been sting operations for terrorism. And what you've seen with the ISIS cases is a marked increase in the percentage of cases that the FBI is bringing that are informant cases. So, for example, this year in 2017, where we We've only seen 17 indictments so far. Uh, I think it's over 80 percent of them are FBI stings. So it tells you that they see this as a preventive model that they're uh, relying upon, but it's got a lot of controversy around it. Is there a profile of the type of person that does this? There is no profile. The most frequent age is 20 years old. They're usually men. They could males. Mm -hmm. They can be from any ethnic background. Many of them are looking for their day in the sun. Many are looking for purpose or some kind of mission. But that is not something quantifiable and not something predictable. So oh. no. One of the things that uh, leapt out from the report was what 78 percent of defendants are U.S. citizens, 60 yeah. percent born in the U.S. Yeah. yeah, these are Americans. They're American kids who who grow up and have and have make a decision at some point in their late adolescence, for the most part, mm -hmm. that they um, they want to engage in violence or that they are fantasizing about violence. And many of them come to ISIS late in their sort of wandering. Some of them trying to join militias first. Some of them tried to join the uh, army first. You know, it's a it's a different patterns. You know, so does Europe look at U.S. as a model then? I don't think so. Europe is much closer to the fight in the Middle East. The numbers of returning fi foreign fighters to Europe are, um, you know, staggering in terms of their numbers. That's what they're worried about. The numbers of uh, Muslims in jail and in prison in Europe is very high. And so prison radicalization is also very important. The, our sample, not our sample, the 135 cases, very few of them had criminal records. Some of them may have engaged with police in, in the past, but they have not served time in prison. They have not been indicted. Um, they haven't been foreign fighters. So it's a different, it's a different context. You, know, you show that the numbers have actually been decreasing year over year since 2015. So yeah. w what are we to think of that? Does that mean that we're th we're, it's working, our interventions or our punishments, or is the strategy shifted? I think the law enforcement has sent out a very clear message. Don't go there. Don't think about it. That's the first thing. The second thing is, during the first year, a number of these individuals wanted to go abroad. They wanted to fight. They were foreign fighters. And the FBI intervened in a very strong way there, but I don't think it was just that. I think the news headlines about what happened when these individuals went abroad, I think the amount of brutality and death has made individuals who want to go abroad um, you know, much less. And it may be that some of the counter extremism programs that are active in places like Minneapolis and other major cities around the country may, may be working. All right, Karen Greenberg from the Center on National Security at Fordham Law School. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un recently said his goal is to reach an equilibrium of real force with the United States and dissuade talk of U.S. military action against his regime, and that he wants to finish his nuclear weapons program despite sanctions. Kim's comment comes after North Korea test-fired a ballistic missile over northern Japan for the second time in just a few weeks. North Korea state-run media released this video, which shows the missile launch, along with these photos of Kim Jong-un watching it. 
The North Korean threat and China's assertiveness in the South China Sea underscore how Japan still relies on the U.S. military for protection, just as it has since the end of World War II. Earlier this month, Defense Secretary Jim Mattis said the U.S. will work with Japan to enhance its missile defenses, and the U.S. commitment to defend Japan remains, quote, ironclad. In tonight's signature segment, NewsHour Weekend Special Correspondent Amy Gutman reports from the Japanese island of Okinawa on how U.S. bases there are a cause of concern to many residents. And then on April 1st, at 0530 in the morning. U.S. Marine Mark Waycaster leads tours of the 1945 Battle of Okinawa every week. We dropped 4,500 tons of ordnance on that beach. Okinawa was the bloodiest battle in the Pacific during World War II. 14,000 Americans were killed, as were 150,000 Japanese military and civilians, and U.S. troops never left. The American soldiers have been the cornerstone of the post-World War II pact to protect a demilitarized Japan. U.S. troops deployed from Okinawa to fight the wars in Korea and Vietnam. Soldiers came back for rest and relaxation. The troops also provide economic security. 9,000 Okinawans work on the bases, and many more at businesses supporting them. Emblems of the fused culture are all over the island. In this area, there were more than 100 bars. Tomoteru Tamari's family owned a restaurant that thrived during the more lucrative years of the Vietnam War. And here? My mother. My father, he became so prosperous that all of us nine children were able to go to university, thanks to the U.S. base. But those benefits are outweighed for most Okinawans by a feeling of endless military occupation. After Japan surrendered in World War II, Okinawa was kept under American military rule for more than two decades. Residents of the island only won the right to elect their own governor in 1968. Today, there are 29,000 troops on Okinawa, more than half of the 56,000 U.S. troops still stationed in Japan. One of the U.S. military bases, Futenma Air Station, sits in a dense urban area right in the middle of the island. Marine Lieutenant General Lawrence Nicholson is the highest ranking U.S. military officer on Okinawa. He says today's global threats make the mission here as relevant as ever. We have China, North Korea, Russia, and the violent uh, uh, extremism uh, that is occurring today in Mindanao of the Philippines. The location here, um, a couple hundred miles south of, of Japan, puts us uh, centrally located to be able to respond quickly, very, very quickly to a Korean scenario from here uh, to a defense of, of all of our allies. Okinawa's location, allies. within two hours flight time to the Korean Peninsula, three hours to Russia, make it both vulnerable and valuable to the U.S. Certainly we're concerned about uh, the longer range missiles. Kim Jong-un uh, has launched more missiles in his uh, short time uh, than his father and grandfather combined. So the obsession with uh, weaponizing uh, and, and Delivering uh, nuclear weapons uh, has, has caused us uh, significant concern. All right, sir, bleed on brakes. Japan shares the burden of the costs of U.S. deployment. It pays the U.S. $1.7 billion a year for the protection, about a third of the $5.5 billion the military spends in the whole country. The Japanese government in Tokyo also sends Okinawa funds for hosting the Americans. Despite the government subsidies and spending by military personnel, a majority of Okinawans want the American troops to leave. One of the biggest complaints, nearly 6,000 crimes committed by U.S. military personnel since 1972, according to police records. When three U.S. servicemen abducted and raped a 12-year-old girl in 1995, public outrage soared and propelled talks to reduce troop levels on the island. In 2014, the crime rate for the U.S. military personnel in Okinawa reached a historic low. But last year, residents were reminded of past brutalities when a U.S. military contractor raped and murdered a 20-year-old woman. How do you explain these atrocities? You can't explain it. We were as shocked and horrified uh, by the incident uh, as anyone. The, the fact that it was an American civilian working on a base that had committed this um, was, was devastating. 
we have an obligation to be better. That pledge is little solace for Kinjo Takamasa. His mother managed a bar near a base in the northern part of Okinawa. In 1974, she died when a U.S. Marine hit her in the head with a brick during a robbery. I used to think the U.S. military was helping to revitalize our town, but it was an illusion because I became a victim. Six days a week, protesters gather outside this base to complain about the military presence, including the noise and the safety risks of U.S. aircraft flying above. V-22 Ospreys take off from Futenma Air Station every day. The controversial and accident-prone aircraft takes off like a helicopter and flies like a plane. They cruise over homes, hospitals, and schools. Practically next door, Professor Masaaki Tomochi teaches international relations at the University of Ryukyu. How regularly do you hear planes oh. taking off and landing? Uh, every day, uh, from the morning to the nighttime, actually. Six months ago, one Osprey crashed in Okinawa. Okinawa Governor Takeshi Onaga is leading the fight to reduce the American military presence. We depend on security from U.S. military bases in this country, but the Japanese government, they are willing to locate all the bases in Okinawa. I can't tolerate this over-concentration of U.S. bases. Onaga calls it over-concentration because Okinawa represents less than 1% of Japan's land, yet 64% of the Japanese land used for U.S. bases is on the island. Since his election three years ago, he's tried to block construction in this picturesque, sparsely populated area in the northern part of the island, called Hinoko Bay, where a new base would replace Butenma Air Station. So what do you see as the solution? Okinawa mo. I'd like all Japanese to shoulder the burden of hosting U.S. bases. When I speak with people coming from mainland Japan, I say, why don't you host U.S. military bases in your hometown? The U.S. has agreed to reduce its presence in Okinawa by relocating 9,000 Marines to bases in Guam, Australia, Hawaii, and other American states. But there's no fixed timeline for that to happen. The military has returned 12,000 acres of land once used for bases and training to the Okinawan government, with 3,000 more acres promised. Professor Tomochi sees more risks than rewards in relocating Futenma Air Station. You don't see its strategic value. If the U.S. and Japan uh, think that their potential enemy is China, for example, if China launched missile to U.S. military bases in Japan, including Okinawa, you know, <laughs> it's useless. <laughs> so do you feel more safe or less safe with oh. the military here? <laughs> it's less safe. It means we became a target. Most Okinawans oppose a new airfield in Hinoko Bay, but construction has begun and the Japanese government is footing the bill. Kinjo Takamasa has been among those protesting the project and its environmental impact. This is sacred ocean for me, a sanctuary. I became a protester because the U.S. base destroyed nature. Businessman Tomoteru Tamari, whose father owned that thriving restaurant, is among the minority of Okinawans who support the new airfield, as do local officials, hoping it will revive the area's fortunes. Some residents who had moved out are starting to move back. There's hope the population will increase and create a better environment for children, better education. But Okinawa's government says the island would be better off with more private development. It says this town, built on land reclaimed from the U.S. military and now home to an entertainment and shopping complex, has an economic impact 100 times greater than the base that was here before. Okinawans would like to replicate that success, turning more prime real estate used by the military into valuable destinations for commerce and tourism like this beach where the U.S. Marines first landed in 1945.
Bangladesh accused neighboring Myanmar today of repeatedly violating its airspace with drones and helicopters, but Myanmar denied it, adding it's been transporting rations to refugees near the border. Around 400,000 Muslims, known as the Rohingya, have fled mostly Buddhist Myanmar into Bangladesh during the last month. The exodus began when Myanmar's military cracked down on an armed resistance by the long-persecuted Rohingya minority and burning Rohingya villages. A United Nations official called the actions by Myanmar's military a, quote, textbook example of ethnic cleansing. For more on the Rohingya refugee crisis, I'm joined by Reuters Myanmar Bureau Chief Anthony Slodkowski via Skype from Bangkok in neighboring Thailand. Anthony, let me just start with the, 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 the scenes that we have witnessed over the past several weeks. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of humans fleeing one country and going directly into Bangladesh who don't really have the capacity to host them. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, it's a horrible uh, humanitarian disaster of epic proportions. Uh, we're seeing, as you said, uh, hundreds of thousands of people who have fled um, uh, Myanmar in a very short period of time. And uh, humanitarian agencies and the United Nations agencies in the na in neighboring Bangladesh are struggling with uh, the most basic um, uh, supplies such as water, food and uh, sanitation. So this is really a, a, a humanitarian disaster of, of huge proportions. What do we know about the burning of these villages that is driving so many of these refugees to cross the border? So the Myanmar government blames the Rohingya insurgents uh, on the fires, but um, people who have uh, crossed the border and um, organizations such as um, uh, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch point the finger at the Myanmar military, um, uh, saying that it's uh, the Myanmar military organizing a campaign of arson uh, and intimidation um, to drive the Rohingya out of, uh, out of Myanmar. Now, Aung San Suu Kyi has chosen not to come to the UN General Assembly. Uh, has she made many public statements about what's going on? Not many. She made a, a public statement in the immediate aftermath, praising the security forces and condemning the attacks. And in subsequent appearances, she referred to these attacks as terrorism. Um, but the silence is about to change because uh, Suu Kyi is uh, uh, scheduled to deliver what's billed as the State of the Union address uh, on Tuesday. So all eyes will be on her during that uh, address. All right, Anthony Slutkowski, Myanmar Bureau Chief of Reuters, joining us via Skype from Bangkok, Thailand today. Thanks so much. Thank you. This is PBS NewsHour Weekend, Saturday. The Trump administration is defying a court order to release the names of everyone who's visited President Trump at his Florida golf resort since his inauguration. In July, a federal judge ordered the public disclosure, but yesterday the Justice Department provided only 22 names, all members of the Japanese Prime Minister's delegation when he visited in February. Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics and two other groups had sued for the visitor logs at Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach, where Mr. Trump has spent 25 days since taking office. The Justice Department maintains the president's schedule is exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. Jeffrey Sandusky, a son of Penn State football assistant coach Jerry Sandusky, who was convicted of sexually abusing underage boys, is heading to prison for his own sex crimes. The 41-year-old is expected to serve six to eight years in state prison following yesterday's guilty plea for soliciting nude photos from a 16-year-old girl and asking a 15-year-old girl for oral sex. Jeffrey Sandusky, a former state prison guard, is one of Jerry Sandusky's six adopted children. He had been set to go to trial next week. The elder Sandusky was convicted in 2012 in a trial for molesting 10 boys. Veteran Hollywood character actor Harry Dean Stanton, who appeared in more than 200 movies and TV shows, died yesterday of natural causes. See, an ordinary person spends his life avoiding tense situations. Repo man spends his life getting into tense situations. The Kentucky-born Stanton created memorable supporting roles in such films as Repo Man and Alien and had a rare star turn in Paris, Texas. Stanton also appeared in The Godfather Part II, Pretty in Pink, and most recently in the revival of TV's Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks director David Lynch once said, no one gives a more honest, natural, truer performance than Harry Dean Stanton. Stanton was 91 years old.
And join us tomorrow on PBS NewsHour Weekend. We'll have the story of major American businesses that aren't waiting for the government and are taking their own action on climate change. That's all for this edition of PBS NewsHour Weekend. I'm Hari Srinivasan. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.